Welcome to Baobab Breadwood and Neem, the Peace Vigil interview series which seeks to inspire hope and action for peace. Peace Vigil works on peace education. Today we'll be talking with Peter Friedrich, a writer and activist based in Texas. Peter works on issues related to the rise of Hindutva in India, and especially about connections between hate in India and fundraising in the USA. This is a short clip of Peter addressing the City Council of Frisco, Texas, about the RSS. For Christians, India is now ranked the 10th most dangerous country in the world. They routinely face hundreds of mob attacks per year, attacks where armed mobs of 50 or 100 or 250 or 500 invade Sunday services to destroy the sanctuary, beat the congregants, and drag them into the streets. And yet, just last week, right here in Frisco, Texas, we had an American nonprofit organization fundraising to support the demolition of churches in India at a time when Indian Christians are falling under the knife day by day by day. And this is another clip of him addressing the city council of Dallas, Texas. Fascism is rising, indeed has already risen in India. And your voices today could help to not only slow or even stop its rise, but also help to comfort those tens of thousands of Indian Americans of religious minority backgrounds who are your constituents in the DFW area. Thank you for your time. Thank you. As you can see from these clips, Peter is passionate about his work confronting Hindutva. Our co-founder, Shirin, had the opportunity to ask him about why he chose to work on India and a number of other topics. If you enjoyed this content, please remember to like and subscribe. With that, please enjoy this interview with Peter Friedrich. Greetings of peace, Peter Friedrich. Welcome. Thank you, Shirin. I'm glad to be here. You know, there's a lot that is not right in our world. Why does Hindutva deserve special consideration? Well, um, I think a lot of things deserve consideration. And certainly, you know, we could pinpoint all over the place a lot of conflicts that are happening currently, new conflicts that have broken out. Certainly Ukraine and Russia uh, would be one of them. We have some older conflicts. Um, we've got Afghanistan with the Taliban. We've got uh, issues in Pakistan, you know, just to speak of South Asia. We have, of course, issues related to uh, the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and human rights there. We have uh, issues related to Africa, especially Egypt, uh, Syria, uh, which not technically Africa, but Nigeria is, is a big one these days, and so on and so forth. Palestine, of course. All of these are ongoing. Hindutva uh, in India, however, one of the reasons I think it deserves special consideration is because it's an issue that the broader world is not generally aware of yet. So, for instance, if we look at the Palestine conflict, um, for decades, the broader world has been keenly aware of that, and it's it's on the radar of people all around the globe. If we look at Ukraine, you know, which broke out uh, earlier this year, everybody knows about the Ukraine conflict. If we look at what's happening in India with Hindutva and the rise of internationalism, however, it's really gone under the radar, uh, has uh, almost arguably been brushed under the rug uh, effectively, uh, by the Hindutva crowd, which is what they want to do, is they want to brush it under the rug. Mm -hmm. And just throughout the rest of the world, most people, by and large, uh, except for, in many cases, some elected officials and people in those kinds of positions of power, just are not aware of it. And um, that lack of awareness, well, why is it present? You know, there's a lot of reasons one could argue, as I just mentioned, uh, the Hindutva crowd um, abroad, which has a broad global network, uh, is very dedicated to keeping uh, focus away from the even the existence of Hindutva or H Hindu nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, I think within a lot of the countries outside of India, especially within a lot of the Western countries, that there's just this general ignorance of what the nature is of society and politics in India, and that up until the present day, even to the present day, that by and large, to generalize, but uh, by and large, um, the typical person in the West tends to still view India through that rose-tinted lens of 
Gandhi, Bollywood, and yoga, and the India consists of nothing more. They're not aware of the complexities of the society, the, the diversity of the languages and the cultures, the complexities of the politics, and so on and so forth. Um, any, any other reasons you can think of? Yes, well, um, as far as why it's so imperative, um, well, India is uh, the second largest country in the world by population, neck and neck with China. It's uh, one of the most influential countries in the world, uh, growing more and more uh, influential by the day. It's a massive country um, with huge influence on the entire South Asian region, with uh, which is centered uh, in an area where there's two nuclear armed powers that are at animosity with each other. In fact, three, if you count China, uh, between Pakistan, China, and India. And where India goes is where South Asia goes. And the direction of South Asia um, really has a great influence on, on the whole globe, especially as we become a, you know, more of a world community, we're interconnected. Uh, uh, India and the US, for instance, these days are increasingly um, unconditional uh, partners. Um, and so they're literally on the other on the opposite sides of the globe from each other. And so what happens in India impacts all around the globe, as well as it impacts the it, it, it impacts 1.4 billion people in this world. So with the growth of Hindutva, we can be concerned about other issues in other countries, legitimately so, and we should be, and we should pay attention to them. Um, but most of those other issues impacts, for instance, much smaller populations. And as India is heading in this direction with Hindutva being in a place where it basically is in complete iron-clad, iron-gripped control of the country, it's on the verge of becoming, if not arguably already has become, the world's largest fascist, fascist country. And that's very concerning. And that's very concerning in a way that I think is not to minimize uh, what's happening in other places in the world, but it's very concerning in, in ways that, um, in, in, in much different ways from the concern that we might have about, say, what's happening in Israel or Syria or Russia or so on. But I do want to understand a little bit more about why people don't know. Do you think the reason for it could be that it was never a dominant philosophy in Indian politics since 1947? The, the politicians in India uh, took deliberate steps to keep it at bay. Do you think that could be the reason why internationally uh, the you know Hindutva fascism uh, is not uh, understood or uh, people don't know about it? I think, yes, that is probably one of the reasons is that Hindutva, uh, the, Hindutva is a dominant philosophy within India, really only took root after the uh, destruction of the Fabri Masjid, which I should note we're recording this on 6 December, at least for me. Um, and uh, it's now the 30 year anniversary today of the destruction of the Fabri Masjid. And that destruction was really the point at which the Hindutva movement with all of its uh, uh, entities, with the RSS, BJP, VHP, et cetera, really uh, began to enter into the public eye and really began to have their uh, power begin to, to solidify, especially through the propaganda that was propagated alongside that destruction. Um, and then once you had that destruction, followed by several months where a thousand, two thousand, or whatever it was, Muslims across northern India were subsequently slaughtered, and impunity was offered uh, for the the murder of those Muslims. Impunity was offered for the destruction of the Babri Masjid um, with this mob demolition. Then that really uh, allowed uh, empowered uh, Hindutva uh, crowd and the Hindutva ideo ideologues to uh, see that, okay, well, if, if we're not going to get tamped down now when we've when we've done this blatant uh, atrocity, then maybe we are in a position where it's safe for us to begin expanding more overtly. Um, since 1947, I mean, because the RSS is the, the fountainhead of, of Hindutva was founded in 1925, while India was still under the, under the uh, British Empire, still within the British Raj, 
And then at that time, you know, of course, as many people familiar with Indian politics know, the RSS actively chose not to involve themselves in the freedom struggle. Instead, they wanted to focus on building up their organization and on networking across the country and on establishing their ideology, which was this ideology of Hindu Rashtra, Hindu nation, of non-Hindus are not welcome in India, et cetera, et cetera. And so from 1925 until 47, when India got independence, they were under the radar because they weren't doing anything against the British. From 47 onwards, of course, you know, with that, that blip in, in 48, where the RSS was briefly banned after an RSS member assassinated Gandhi and, and kind of rose to uh, attention of the government. But after that, they actively, for the most part, uh, eschewed, avoided politics um, and chose to only work within the uh, social uh, arena. And as they were doing that up until, uh, what, 1980, when they finally founded the BJP, um, as you know, they had, of course, a, a precursor party to that, but that precursor party was really under the radar even then and didn't actually do much. Up until 80, 1980, when they founded the BJP, they weren't involved in politics. They weren't pursuing political office for the most part. They were simply building their networks and uh, just propagating that, ide that ideology uh, far and wide. Mm -hmm. And so it's only really in the past 30 years or so, especially since 92, um, when uh, the Babur Masjid was destroyed, that the actions, um, like the, the real world on the ground, physical manifestation of the ideology, the actions of Hindutva have uh, come to prominence uh, in the uh, in the minds of the public and in the minds of the uh, the um, those on an international scale who would be paying attention to these issues. And then, of course, it wasn't even until uh, the mid 90s, 98, when the BJP actually uh, you know, got a coalition government elected for the first time in India. The, the world, especially these uh, international governments, had any particular reason to pay attention to that movement because it wasn't really terribly strong up until up until the the early uh, mid eighties, early nineties, and then of course ninety eight. And also, Peter, just to point out here that not only did the RSS not support the freedom movement against the colonial rule of the British, but it actually helped the British government to undermine the Indian struggle against uh, against them. So and th this is well documented. It's it's people can research. And recently, in fact, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's great grandson, Tushar Gandhi, has made um, uh, public many of the documents available. But also, you know, one interesting thing about Gandhi's murder, which you just referred to, is that in a way it stopped the RSS from expanding. Uh, because, you know, 1947 was a, uh, was a, an opportunity for them to expand since Pakistan had been created. So they the whole rhetoric, uh, anti-Muslim rhetoric, and, you know, sort of the, that um, Hindu nationalism rhetoric was in the air. But Mahatma Gandhi his murder but there was, there, stopped was fertile, that. there was fertile ground for that kind of rhetoric at that particular moment. But yeah, it's, then once, exactly. once, they, once they murdered, assassinated Gandhi, I think that in the uh, minds of the Indian public, because Gandhi was was so revered, um, that that probably uh, very uh, arguably, but very strong argument that really kind of dipped it in the bud and uh, kind of they shot themselves in the foot, actually. Uh, by, by yeah, so that. so I think Gandhi in his life and in his death was able to bring people together, uh, which really is is an amazing thing. I don't think he knew that it, it that's what's <laughs> going to happen, but you know that's what happened. People did come together. Now moving on, uh, Peter, I know that you're not Indian, as far as I know, you don't have any connection uh, family wise with India. So what prompted you to take up this issue? No, I'm, I'm not Indian, not last I checked. Um, I, I don't have any any Indian family. Um, but um, what prompted me? Well, it's it's a long story, uh, a lot of ups and downs. Um, but um, I began in 2006. I was about 20 years old. Um, I happened to uh, meet some Sikhs, actually. Uh, Sikhs uh, and Sikhism was my first introduction to anything from the Indian subcontinent. And um, I met them and began talking with them, particularly about issues like the 1984 Sikh genocide. Um, and they were interested in, um, and I was interested when I learned about it, in um, 
trying to draw attention of the West to that atrocity. Um, and that really piqued my interest uh, because there's a lot of things that um, I don't appreciate about my upbringing. But one of the things I do appreciate is that I grew up um, as I think a lot of Westerners, a lot of Americans do. Um, I grew up on this uh, steady, steady diet of uh, consumption of um, materials about the Second World War, particularly about Nazi Germany. Uh, I grew up uh, reading uh, novels about it, um, I, especially a lot of novels written like the 50s, 60s, 70s. I grew up watching a lot of movies about it, especially like some of the movies from the 40s, the 50s, and then some of the later movies from like the 70s. One of my favorites, I think, is uh, uh, Clint Eastwood in, in Dirty Dozen, if I recall correctly. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I like some of the newer stuff, like Saving Private Ryan and all of that. But the stuff that really, like, I, I particularly uh, enjoy and particularly consumed growing up was all the older stuff from, like, the 60s and 70s, especially, and even earlier. Um, I grew up reading a lot of history books about it, watching a lot of documentaries about it. And I'd never personally experienced it. Um, and unlike a lot of Americans, I don't actually have family that fought in the Second World War. But... I did grow up with just like, as I was consuming this, this innate general uh, hatred of Nazis. Um, I'm like, oh, those are those are really the bad guys. I grew up watching stuff like um, and reading stuff like, uh, in particular, um, The Hiding Place, uh, which is the story of Corey Ten Boom uh, from the Netherlands, uh, who was a um, Unmarried in her in her late fifties, uh, she and her sister they lived with their father. Her fa their father was a watchmaker, and uh, as the Netherlands were occupied by the Nazi Germans, um, the this family, including Corey and her and her sister and father, provided a hiding place within uh, their home for um, quite a number of of uh, Jews who were fleeing uh, persecution. They were ultimately discovered. They were arrested. Uh, Corey Ten Boom and her sister and her father were all sent to concentration camps. Corey, uh, uh, Corey's sister died in the in the camp. Corey's father uh, died in the camp. Corey survived, uh, and after she survived, she wrote books about it. She went on speaking tours around the world, and uh, that's one of the things. I actually just re recently rewatched the feature film uh, story of of uh, her uh, time during world, the Second World World War. That's one of the things that really touched my heart. So hatred of Nazis, like just uh, this um, passion um, about uh, what happened with with the Holocaust, um, and like this this horror this horror at, at it, um, and this like disbelief that something like that could happen, and so that all of that just really sat in my gut, um, and kind of like sank deep into my heart. Um, and then when I encountered um, Sikhs and learned about the 84 genocide, um, and then from there, on, from there uh, over the next several years, I began to encounter, I think next I encountered um, Dalits and Ambedkarites and got introduced to the anti-caste movement. I began encountering Indian Muslims. I soon learned about 2002 Gujarat, I think was probably the next uh, major atrocity I learned about. I learned about Odisha 2008, the pogrom against Christians there. Um, and I, I, began, I began to learn about all of this. I started writing about issues like torture by police in India. Um, and um, I submitted, I actually had a submission uh, that was accepted by the UN uh, for their universal periodic review written at the time under a pseudonym because I wasn't sure if I really wanted to commit to using my real name on these issues. And just along the way, um, over the next several years, I began became uh, heavily involved with the Indian diaspora. Um, and these all of these atrocities really, really touched my heart, especially in light of my, my upbringing and my hatred of fascism and Nazism. And I got a chance to do things like uh, in 2012, I believe, I was invited to help organize a uh, centennial celebration for the uh, Anna, or for the uh, well, centennial, uh, anniversary uh, celebration for the 100th anniversary of the Stockton Sea Gurdwara, which is the oldest in the United States. In 2013, I got a chance uh, to be invited to help organize um, a, again, centennial celebration of Dr. Ambedkar's arrival at Columbia University um, and got a chance to also speak there at Columbia. 
and then um, just started to become very heavily involved with with the Sikh uh, uh, diaspora, with the Dalit diaspora, uh, with some Muslim diaspora, and then 2014 hit. Um, and 2014 hit, and uh, right in 2013, 2014, I um, began to um, get involved uh, with Sikhs and Muslims in particular, who are trying to get US Congress to push past this House resolution that would have condemned um, the uh, violence by Hindu nationalists and also would have um, um, encouraged the US State Department to continue denying Modi his visa and uh, got involved in going around to congressional offices and encouraging them to sign on to that. And then Modi got elected and so on and so forth. And I could go on, but um, that's kind of what got me started over over uh, the first uh, decade or so, first eight years or so. So Peter, a couple of things that uh, come to mind after uh, what you've explained regarding your background is that your upbringing or anyone's upbringing and the education they're given and the things they're exposed to as they're growing up does have a huge impact on how they're able to see things, whether they're able to see similarities and dissimilarities and figure out for themselves that the things that they have studied or have been exposed to uh, may still be continuing in the world. And what is it that they want to stand up against? What is it that they want to support? So it's really a question of values, but also a question of analyses. So, you know, for example, many people study about the Second World War, they study about Nazism and fascism, but they're unable to see the parallels. And I think there has to be enough understanding of these issues. Uh, to be able to see those parallels. But unfortunately, people are not being exposed even. I mean, forget about analyses, uh, but they're not even being taught these important historical happenings. So, for example, in India, a lot has been removed from uh, history textbooks. Uh, people don't even know what happened in the past. Well, we... I, speak, I speak with a lot of Indians and um... I don't mean to overgeneralize, but my experience has been that many of the Indians I speak with are um, very unaware of just how significant the Second World War was for, especially for the, the Western Hemisphere, how much it impacted, uh, to what extent uh, issues, incidents like the Holocaust really resonate with the Western people, even to the present day. Um, and and, and the, level of, the level of horror um, that's connected with that, you know, even what, uh, 60, 70 years later. Um, and um, I, I think that uh, there's a lot of reasons why um, I think that is. Certainly one of them would be the um, col uh, colonization by the British. At the time of the Second World, World War, India was still a, a colonized uh, uh, territory. And so from, from that perspective, there's, uh, there's a rationalization that one cannot, you know, wrap one, one's mind around as far as why Indians who were uh, under colonial domination during World War II um, at the time had less sympathy for the, the allies that were waging that war against the fascists. And also, you know, even today, uh, don't quite uh, understand um, or, uh, you know, have, have empathy for maybe in some cases. Um, for um, the atrocities that were that were committed by the Axis powers. You know, you could see the parallel also in the way the Sikhs were treated in 1984. Many people don't see that because uh, of various reasons, but also because, unfortunately, the Indian government post-1984 riots, or so-called riots, it was really a pogrom, um, you know, it didn't do enough to condemn um, these atrocities in the history textbooks. And therefore, I don't think the kind of um, anger that should have developed after 84 happened. And, and, and I think that is very sad, but you were able to see that. So as a peace educator, I see that what happened in 1984 or later, you know, in Gujarat are pretty much the same things. It's just that the victims are different, but it's it's really the same philosophy that's driving it. And um, all the research that has been done uh, about 1984 shows that there were Hindutva elements 
that were at the forefront uh, uh, in the 1984 pogrom, you know, in, 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 in the violence that happened? Yes, I look at uh, 1984, um, especially like, you know, after studying it for some, some years, I've met survivors. Um, I look at 1984 as um, and the impunity that was offered for it, certainly is uh, one aspect. The impunity for 1984 set the stage for impunity for 1992 with the Barbary Masjid, which set the stage for impunity for 2002 with Gujarat. And then on a, uh, thank God, on a smaller scale, but set, set the stage for impunity for 2008 in Odisha and so on and so on and so forth. And so the, in fact, uh, if, if the government had done enough in 1984 uh, to tell people that, look, this is unacceptable. And if people had gone to jail, I don't think that things would have taken uh, the people, turn that they people did. people had gone to jail, if there had been an immediate reaction from the government saying, you know, this, this is and this should be nothing more than an aberration. This can never become a pattern in our country. We're going to immediately do every. We're going to move move heaven and hell uh, in order to make sure we arrest and try, you know, justly try, but with speed, try and convict those who are accused and make sure they get the maximum penalties. Make sure that this is shown from you know top to bottom of our country is totally unacceptable. Then I, I I think that there's a very strong argument to be made. The, the subsequent atrocities, which were more overtly committed by Hindutva elements, by the RSS and its affiliates, would either never have happened or would have been um, much more easily uh, nipped in the bud and stopped. So, Peter, now I would like to discuss something which is actually related to this. That is that if we don't pay attention to fascism growing, um, it can actually become a monster that uh, is just almost impossible to tame. Or, you know, even if it is tamed, it takes many generations, perhaps. Yeah. So um, I want to discuss now the growth of Hindutva in the U.S., and I know that you've been working very hard to stop that growth from happening and bringing awareness uh, to Americans. Um, I would like you to please talk about that. Are there specific organizations that are involved or is it only limited to individual level? Oh, there's definitely specific organizations. Um, you know, of course, um, you know, I like to preface these things for people that might be non-Desi, non-Indian, that might be unfamiliar with the general um, lay of the situation. Uh, in India, of course, you have the, the Song Harivar, the, the family of uh, Hindu nationalist organizations, this whole spidery network. And at the top, you have the RSS, which is like the mothership. Where, like for any sci-fi fans, like you always have a mothership. And then in, in, in these sci-fi movies, the mothership sends out these other smaller ships that go and do you know, different things. And so you have the RSS, and then beneath that, you've got, of course, you know, the RSS has dozens of subsidiaries that are special interest. You know, uh, you've got for uh, labor, for judges, for farmers, for uh, attorneys, for uh, students, uh, for, you know, anything and everything you can think of under the sun. The most important of which being the, the VHP, the religious wing, the Bajrang Dal, the student or the youth wing of the VHP, which is the religious wing of the RSS, the BJP, the, um, the political wing, and, and so on and so forth. All those major ones in particular have pretty direct um, uh, corollaries or parallel organizations abroad. Uh, which are around the globe uh, in many different countries. And in particular, in the U.S. here, we've got the RSS has the HSS. The VHP, the religious wing of the RSS, has the VHP America. The BJP, the political wing of the RSS, has the overseas friends of the BJP, the OFBJP, and so on and so forth. And those are really the main particular organizations that I call like, again, the, the Song Paravar. So I call those like the American Song Paravar, the American Family of Internationalist Organizations, or the American Song for short. Um, there's there's five major ones, which I refer to as like the name brand, uh, American Song Organizations, which would be the HSS, the VHP America, the Overseas Friends of the BJP, SEVA International, which is like the charitable wing, and Ekal Vidyalaya, which is like the educational wing. Um, and um, so to answer your question, yes, 
there are definitely uh, particular organizations within within the U.S. However, beyond those, and these are harder to identify, there are a lot of affiliated organizations or like ideologically similarly minded or like minded organizations. Um, one of which actually just came to uh, prominence um, in Texas a couple of weeks ago or about just a little over a week ago, uh, which is uh, the Global Hindu Heritage Foundation or GHHF, or as I like to say, GWHF, because GHHF is a tongue twister. Uh, but GWHF, or the Global Hindu Heritage Foundation, registered in Texas, and they came to prominence uh, just uh, on November 27, 2002, um, because they were organizing a fundraiser in which they put out a flyer for this fundraiser, and two of the major things that they said they wanted to raise money for at this fundraiser uh, one was for Garvapsi, or reconversion ceremonies of uh, people in India. So raising money in Texas for Garvapsi of Indian citizens in India, uh, which is reconversion generally, by and large, um, over the years, it's been seen in many of these reconversion ceremonies that a lot of force or heavy pressure is applied, where what they do is they go and they approach people who've converted to Christianity or Islam or in some cases, other religions, and they get them to uh, reconvert, quote unquote, back to Hinduism, to their the, the faith of their ancestors. Um, and then also uh, this uh, Global Hindu Heritage Foundation wanted to raise money for uh, demolition of churches, uh, in, in particular in Tirupati and Andhra Pradesh. Did, um, they, did they actually say that? Uh, yes, on their flyer, they say that they, they're, one of their goals for the fundraiser is to raise money for demolition of churches. And now they specify the quote unquote illegal churches, uh, but within context of what's happening in India today, that's a very uh, that's nebulous, terrible. very okay. nebulous um, um, uh, definition of, a, of illegal. Um, the goal of the RSS uh, ideologically since its founding is to eliminate Christians and Muslims in particular from the country. And it's put that goal into actual action um, many times with physical violence against these communities. And so when, for instance, this organization here in America says that they want to raise money to demolish quote unquote illegal churches back in India, um, the illegal is um, can can be and should be taken as a very flexible definition of illegal. Plus, uh, the, plus, I mean, if it is illegal, it should be the state that should be dealing with that, not uh, not a nonprofit or a cultural organization. And I'm not a nonprofit or a cultural organization from outside of the country of India. Yeah. Exactly, especially when uh, the Modi government has denied funds to internationally recognized organizations like like Mother Teresa's uh, foundation, um, the you know, and also many of the NGOs like like Amnesty International in India has had to suffer because Which of these not, restrictions. Which not to rabbit trail too much, but like yes, the, that whole general issue of like what the Modi government has done with I mean, whole host of of Christian NGOs in particular. Uh, Compassion International is one of the really big ones as well. Um, the, the Modi government has has stripped away their right to uh, send funds and fundraise for uh, causes, for charitable causes, for you know fe feeding and clothing the poor and, and funding hospitals and educational institutions. The Modi government has stripped that away, and then we have, of course, um, all of these oftentimes uh, committed by uh, RSS affiliates, like especially VHP Bajrang Dal all these mob attacks, um, constant mob attacks on churches. And to back up a little bit, I have spent a lot of time this year talking in America, trying to get American Christian clergy to pay attention to the issue of persecution of Indian Christians. And when I talk with them, most like 75, 80% of them are completely ignorant of the issue. When I talk with them, one of the questions they oftentimes ask me is like, well, what does persecution of Christians in India look like? And I say that they they say like job discrimination or like social boycotting or something. And I'm like, well, or housing discrimination. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, maybe, you know, that's, that, that's part of it. But no, like what it looks like is, you know, the worst of it is what it looks like is you as a Christian, you're holding Sunday service 
and minding your own business, you're in your church and you're worshiping. And suddenly a mob of like 50 or 100 or 250 or 500 people show up outside of your church and oftentimes armed, oftentimes accompanied by the police. And they burst into the sanctuary. They start smashing up everything in the sanctuary. They start beating the congregants. They drag the congregants and the, and the clergy out into the street. And if the cops aren't there already, then the mob drags the uh, victims down to the police station and turns them into the police station and gets the police to charge and file charges against the victims, not the perpetrators. And I tell people, I tell American Christian clergy that, and they're, uh, it's like a light bulb goes off in their head. And they're like, oh, like the Nazis? And I'm like, yeah, exactly. So, but like you have the mob attacks, you have you have the stripping away of these uh, NGOs and their rights or, you know, send funds in to support the, the least of these, the impoverished people. And you've got, of course, then this fundraiser here in America, which is just one example raising funds to demolish churches back in India. The Modi government has a desire to put a stranglehold uh, on the Christian community um, in India, among others. In addition to being a, a human rights issue for the world, specifically um, with regards to the US, it's also a question of funds being directed from the American soil to a fascist network. Um, in India. So, you know, that's very concerning. Um, do you think that it's mostly a question of money for the fascist organizations? You know, the, the reason why they want to be strong in the US, because, you know, there are a lot of Indians that are doing well. There's also a very large Indian population. What really amazes me is that, you know, the HSS was actually found uh, founded in Africa uh, yes. in 1947. Yes. Yes, in Kenya. And that it's not until the end of 1980, I believe it's 1989 or something that HSS uh, started in the US. And it was in the that, that, that's correct. And point of clarification, that is correct. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, VHP uh, was actually and uh, some of the um, uh, historians of this have commented on how this is actually a, a reversal of the way it's happened in most of these other countries where HSS has, or Hindutva groups have been established. In most countries, like the UK, for instance, HSS came first, and then the other groups like VHB, et cetera. In the US, I believe, don't quote me on this, because I, I'm not so great at remembering exact numbers, but it was sometime in the, I think the mid seventies, that VHB America was established. And so that was established first. And then uh, along the way, the people that established that were the ones that ended up establishing HSS in America, which I think, yes, was in 89. Okay, um, but you know, I guess it it always um, intrigues me that when uh, a chunk of the population that you know fits a certain demographic, like in this case, you know, Hindus, like let's just loosely <laughs> uh, do it because you know Hindus are also come in various shapes and sizes, but uh, let's loosely call call this demographic wait, 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 Hindus. And, and and you know that is a great point. You know, Hindus, no kidding. Hindus come in a lot of shapes and sizes, you know, like not, I mean, you know, uh, uh, metaphorically. Um, and that is exactly what the RSS and the HSS really want to strip away and tamp down. The goal of the RSS uh, is to turn Hinduism into something that is not and never has been, which is a homogenous religion where, you know, like, maybe like the the head of the rss is like is like the pope of the of, of hinduism and if even today 2022 if you look on the rss's website in so many words under their i believe their vision section they specifically state that their goal is to i think the word is engulf uh, every single aspect of hindu society and they list out they list out politics religion education family so on and so forth and they that's their specific goal is to be like to turn hinduism into like the borg where it's just centrally controlled and where exactly. there is where, where there is absence of diversity 
But I, I think that in terms of specifically a, a caste, um, you know, it, it really does divide the Hindu society. And um, in order to bring all the Hindus together, uh, you do need a point of hate. And in this case, it's largely Muslims and to, uh, you know, also, secondly, Christians, because Christians are a much smaller number. So, you know, Muslims tend to be the bigger target, but Christians are also a huge target. It's just that they're smaller in numbers. Um, so Peter, uh, you know, um, a couple of things. One is that I find it intriguing that when a community starts to do well, so in this case, Indians and specifically Hindus, the Hindutva organizations are very quick uh, to to use that uh, to divert funds uh, back to fascist activity activities in India. So that's one thing. And I, I wonder, you know, if you have the same um, understanding that, you know, why is it that Hindutva lobby is so keen on tapping into, into the, you know, Hindu population in the US because there are Hindus all over the world. But somehow, you know, the US has become the main funder uh, I mean, the U.S. Hindus have become the main funders of this hate in India. So, Shreen, there's a lot that I could unpack there, um, but I'm going to try and uh, draw on a couple of thoughts that are coming to my mind. Uh, one of them is that, and again, I'm, I'm not great with offhand remembering the exact dates, but I think it was in the 60s that uh, U.S. immigration really began to open up to the point that Indians could freely travel uh, could freely emigrate to the U.S. Um, and from that point in the 60s, that being the case, those who could afford to in India tended to be primarily people that were already uh, already somewhat moneyed um, and tended to be because, you know, also people that were already that were upper caste. Um, and so even today, uh, the the population of Indian Americans that we have tends to be um, no exact figures, but just tends to be less um, populated by people that are from like the Dalit or the Shudra communities. Um, and so that's that's one aspect as far as like what would tends to veer the Indian American or the you know the Hindu segment of the Indian American population more just more in a direction of that ideology. Um, and then from there, um, well, I would argue perhaps that uh, within America, uh, where we have we have pretty liberal, pretty um, open uh, laws that allow us, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, um, freedom of publication, and especially things like nonprofits, um, which are really uh, allow um, great flexibility and great opportunity to raise large amounts of money tax free. Um, that might be different from what you find even in a lot of these other Western countries. That might be one a factor that impacts why the U.S. would have more of this than, than uh, some of these other Western countries. Uh, but one thing that comes to me also is that um, I do believe that there is a lot of financial power um, and arguably, I, I think pretty conclusively, but there's just not the evidence to actually demonstrate it. Um, that there's a lot of money flowing from India or from America back to India from these groups. And that's that's a huge, uh, huge factor um, as far as like why they're useful to the Hindutva uh, movement back in India. Now, tracing that, proving that is very difficult because that has to really pretty much mostly be done at the level of the state. They have to open up investigations. They have to file um the legal term is escaping me, but they have to file affidavits like demanding access to these financial records and so forth. That's not available to the common citizen. What has also been very useful to the Hindutva movement in India, however, which is available uh, information to the uh, public common citizen in America, is the people power of American Hindutva groups and their ability, which they can afford to do because they have so much money, their ability to send thousands of people back to India, especially during these times of election, to campaign for uh, the election of BJP, which 
they did very significantly in, in 2014. They did again in 2019, which they've actually been doing uh, for the past 20 plus years at least. Um, but then the financial aspect also um, is one where I would draw attention to not just the issue of money being funneled from America to India, but the issue of the money power of the American Hindutva groups um, within and, and the way they use it within America. Because if we look, and um, this is all public record, HSS is a registered nonprofit. The Overseas Friends of the BJP was declared a foreign agent in 2020. So they are no longer a nonprofit, but prior to that they were. VHP America is a nonprofit, Save International and Akal Vidyalaya, they're all nonprofits. And their financial records are because they're nonprofits, are legally, they're legally required to report how much money they've raised year over year. And what kind of what their net worth is, what assets they have, how much money they raised this year, et cetera, et cetera. And if you put all those five together, again, uh, I've looked at them um, in the past, in the past couple of months. I don't remember offhand the exact number, but it's something like uh, 15 million, 20 million dollars a year between these five groups. And all these five groups are pretty much interconnected. Uh, I mean, they're legally separate entities, but their leadership tends to be all, all overlapping. Like Seva International, for instance, the chairman of Seva International is the vice president of HSS USA. And just one example, but there's a lot of examples like that where there's all, so they're basically groups, these five groups that all kind of operate in sync. Um, and they have assets like yearly, year over year assets of probably about $15 million. And as far as I know, most of that is spent in the U.S. And what, so, what, what do they do with this money in the U.S.? Well, uh, one of the things they do um, certainly would be to spread their ideology, um, to propagate their ideology within the diaspora. You know, the HSS, for instance, uh, hosts um, training uh, camps for its volunteers. Um, it hosts um, Sunday schools or like they call them Sunday schools. Uh, for youth. Um, they host youth camps. The VHP in America as well hosts youth camps. Save any any yoga stuff? Because the, you know, the recent <laughs> thing about, um, I think you, you were very prominently involved with it, um, at the California uh, no, thing. Antica. Antica. Yeah. So, um, so do you think some of these more sort of cultural or, you know, like pe people see things like yoga as, oh, you know, it's just yoga. It's, I mean, what, what could be wrong with yoga? Oh, well, but, I, have, uh, I have, I have, I have yeah. no criticism to offer of yoga. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but I mean, using but... these schools or, you know, these events uh, to propagate uh, a b bigoted uh, philosophy is yeah, the danger. So, exactly. Exactly. So with H, I'll just focus on HSS as an example. So one of the things that HSS does, and this is what uh, happened in the city of Manteca, um, is they go around constantly. They've, uh, in, they've really expanded in about the past two years, three years. They go around, um, and I believe in most cases, they're the ones approaching, like doing the solicitation. They go and they approach city councils or county, uh, county boards in particular. And they ask like the city council, Hey, you know, we're we're a cultural religious organization, you know, Hindu Swayam Sivak Song. Would you please pass a resolution or pro pass a proclamation from the city that recognizes our work promoting yoga, or that recognizes our work doing this charitable thing, or that recognizes Hindu Heritage Day? But in recognizing Hindu Heritage Day, make sure to mention HSS by name. And and like different things like that. And they stack these up. They stack up dozens, scores, hundreds of them from around the country. And most of these city councils, um, county boards, are populated by people who they don't know any better. They have no clue what Hindu Swayam Sivak song is. Unfortunately, they're stupid enough or lazy enough or whatever it is that they don't even bother, apparently, apparent conjecturing. They don't even bother Googling the organization for five seconds, because if you did, like you would quickly, you know, find out about it. And so they just assume, well, it's Hindu. It's a religious group. Yeah, it sounds good. Uh, a yoga proclamation and HSS and HSS is telling us, like, you know, we do all this good work around the country. Yet here's your proclamation. 
And then HSS goes to a city council meeting. They typically go in their uniforms and they go and they get formally recognized by the city and accept the proclamation. And one of the benefits of that for HSS is that it helps, you know, well, one, two, three, it helps them get their foot in the uh, door of the halls of power, of the local government power. Um, it helps them to get recognized as a legitimate organization. So that if somebody's speaking against HSS, HSS can point and say like, what, what, what's the problem? We have, we have, you know, 500 city councils that have given us proclamations and say we're great. Um, and it, it just generally helps to whitewash them in, in America. Um, so that when uh, pushing back against their activity, it becomes more difficult. Now, what happened uh, in the city of Manteca was that one such proclamation was passed um, for uh, Yoga Day, um, but not actually for, uh, not actually for, I think, I think there's an International Day of Yoga, which is, I think, in June or something like that. Not for that, but for just a yoga thon being run by HSS in, in like January. Um, and uh, which uh, for a yoga event, which was an HSS yoga event. So I and some members of the uh, of the Indian American diaspora went and some others as well. And I uh, went and informed the city and uh, spoke at the city council and told them, hey, guys, like, you know, we understand you probably did this in innocent ignorance. Uh, but we want to inform you like HSS is the international wing of the RSS. And the RSS is a fascist paramilitary that kills minorities in India. And so we understand you didn't know that, but now that you know that, we're asking you to backtrack and take back that resolution. And the city council over two meetings, um, the, on the, by the second meeting, they put it on the agenda and the uh, HSS got wind of it, that it was gonna be on the agenda. So we we went there with with our people. We had about fifty people, sixty people, mostly uh, Indian Americans, and then HSS showed up. Most of them from out of town um, because they don't have a stronghold in that particular city, and they showed up with a, about 60, 70 people. Over deliberations, the city council finally came to around to the conclusion that, well, first they said maybe we can just alter the resolution, and take up. HSS, which is named in the resolution. And one of the counselors said, well, you know, that's not a bad idea, but the problem is deeper than that. The problem is that the resolution was actually given to the HSS. And so he said, we should just pass a whole new resolution. He said, nobody has a problem with yoga. What we have a problem with is the HSS and the, you know, parent connection to the RSS. Therefore, like, how about if just from the city itself, instead of solicited by an outside group, the city passes a, res a resolution for yoga? And everybody on the city council, everybody on, on the city council said, that's that's a great idea. We're okay with that. All of the people on our side who are opposing the HSS said, yeah, we're, we're okay with that. We're cool with that. But immediately, as soon as that, as that proposal was floated, the HSS people in the crowd started getting boisterous, standing, making a very clear that they found it unacceptable to have a yoga resolution which did not name the HSS. So one thing, Peter, is that this is a victory, really, you know, because, because people persisted and also people noticed because sometimes these things can go unnoticed. And then, you know, after five years, we realize, oh, my God, you know, this is how they spread. So so it's very good that you were noticing, uh, you know, many Indian Americans were noticing. And this is also a point to focus on that there are many Indian Americans who are against uh, the spread of Hindutva. In, and and in, I would add, I would yeah. add, not just many Indian Americans, but many Hindus uh, in America. So uh, this is conjecture, but, um, you know, what I've been uh, pointing out frequently recently is that the R or the HSS itself says it has about 230 branches around the country, and that is not in every state. So like guesstimating from there, if they have 230 branches, arguably maybe to be generous with the numbers, maybe they have 100 members per branch. What is that? That's about 23,000 people. Now, you know, I'll, I'll be even more generous, you know, say maybe 30,000 people. Well, 
if the HSS around the country, and that's not including PHP American, some of these other groups, but most of those are all interconnected anyways. So let's say maybe like 30,000 members within the HSS in America. Well, the Indian American population is, I think about 1.4 million, about half of which is, is Hindus, at least about half of which is Hindus. So that's like 700,000. So out of, out of, you know, probably, and I've seen um, uh, more official numbers of the actual population of Hindus in America, which I don't recall exactly, but it's like 800,000, like 600 to 900,000, something in that range, I believe. So out of, let's say 700,000 Hindus in America, we could conjecture, like educated guess, that there might be about 30,000 members of the HSS, which is a tiny fringe minority of the Hindu population in America, let alone of the Indian American population. Very true that, you know, um, we, we think that these people are very strong, perhaps because they have money. And also because I think, as you said, you know, they make inroads into these, um, these power structures, you know, so through the city council and so on. And for, for one reason, I, another reason I would also argue why, you know, that we have this perception of their, their great strength. Is it because, well, if taking RSS, for for example, you know, uh, similar th uh, quickly, similar thing, RSS is an estimated 6 million members in India out of what a population of at least a billion Hindus. Now, and also, 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 Peter, I must point out that uh, some of the activists at the forefront of the struggle to save democracy in India are Hindus. Um, yes, exactly. So, yes. Now, in the case of the HSS, why is there that perception of strength? One reason I would argue is because if the presumption that I have is true that the RSS is fascist and by by uh, by uh, connection um, by association, the HSS is also fascist or fascistic. Well, one of the things you know that I you know fascists have going for them. One of the benefits of fascism. Is that it's easy? They're they all uniform. They're all about uniformity and conformity. They all walk in lockstep. It's easy to get them all on the same page, and they're all heavily networked. And they end up oftentimes being the most vocal, outspoken, visible, and because they're uniformed, especially visible, visible, outspoken, vocal uh, segment. So they might be just a few thousand people, but they look like a lot more. And, and that perception, I think, is really because I would say it's because of the fascistic um, underlying ideology. True. And I mean, the, the outspokenness is actually more than that. It is it, it is really uh, bullying. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, as as I have noticed in many of the videos, even when they deal with you, uh, it's really not allowing you to speak. Uh, Peter, so um, the thing is that there are many ways to get into power structures, to wield power. Um, and, you know, you have mentioned how the city councils are often um, influenced and the lobby lobbying is done. But what about actual lawmakers? What about members of the Congress, for instance, um, what happens there? Um, because from what we understand, Hindutva has tried very hard to put candidates. Well, um, what we've seen um, is we've seen, in particular, one of the most egregious examples was now former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard from Hawaii, um, who was um, elected, a, she took office in January of 2012. And uh, we have a primary general a primary system, general system with primary elections, general elections here in America, where um, the Hindutva crowd, um, all of these major players in the HSS, the BHP America, the OFBJP around the country, uh, latched onto her very early on before she won her first primary, which is when she gets selected as the candidate uh, for her party and goes on to face the candidate from the candidate from the other party in the general election. And they latched onto her very early. And um, they uh, found her useful in particular at the time in 2012, because these same entities, these same uh, in, uh, personalities were just then mobilizing in 2012 uh, to work to get Modi elected in 2014. 
uh, back in India. And Modi at the time, up until his election, uh, was still banned from uh, America. In fact, he's actually he actually is still banned from America. It's only by virtue of being head of state that he has diplomatic immunity to circumvent that ban. And so leading up to uh, his election, um, as these supporters and financiers of Tulsi Gabbard um, were, were backing her, and then after uh, Modi's election in India, when he was still, uh, he was then allowed to come over here, but he was still kind of persona non grata um, because of his ban and his association with 2002 Gujarat pogrom. Um, Tulsi Gabbard did a lot of work, uh, both before Modi's election in 2014, to try and derail attempts to to criticize him in Congress or criticize Hindu nationalism in Congress and, and things like that. And after 2014, to become one of the first and most um, uh, prominent uh, people to publicly embrace him on American soil and welcome him unconditionally. And um, for a long time, and even uh, till today, uh, she was one of the actually only people really in Congress that was uh, overt person that I would argue uh, was basically in the pocket of these of these people of this of this movement. However, while she was one of the only people um, at the time, quickly after she was elected, I think by about 2015, uh, just a year after, if not earlier, but uh, at least by 2015, um, very quickly after she was elected, she became the second most pow powerful person within the Democratic Party, the number two person within the Democratic Party. So while she was pretty much the only person in Congress that was overtly in the pocket, I would argue, of the Hindutva gang. She was in a place of high influence. Um, and then she went on to, to run for president and so on and so forth. And that was unsuccessful. And I think they, I think their um, ambitions were a little bit bigger than they than the realism of the situation. Um, because running for president for her at that time was not a realistic proposition. But what I do think that they hoped and expected was that she might get a nod for like a cabinet position or something like that, which nobody that's been a Hindutva affiliate has ever actually, or a Hindutva sympathizer has ever actually gotten to this point. Now, to present day, Tulsi Gabbard's out of office. Now we have, again, we only have one person in office uh, in Congress uh, at the moment in U.S. Congress at the federal level, which is Congressman Raja Krishnamurti from Illinois. And again, only one person, but he's become a fairly uh, influential voice within the progressive side of the uh, of the Democratic Party. He also sits on the U.S. House Intelligence Committee, which means he's one of a very small number of members of Congress who are privy to privileged, confidential, uh, classified information. Um, and he also harbors pretty open ambitions to run for U.S. Senate, uh, the, the upper house of, of the uh, legislature. And so if he does that and if he succeeds, then that would be stepping stone, stepping stone uh, to get like another Hindutva ally into like at that point, that would be the highest um, elected office that any Hindutva sympathizer uh, has reached. We have seen you really follow that because, uh, you know, you've gone to many events uh, where Krishnamurti um, was being either praised or you know, they, they, well, an I've, only that... gone to, I've only gone to one event where he was actually physically there. But over the past since since about uh, May, I've spent I've spent a good six or seven weeks uh, at least in uh, his district uh, trying to raise awareness about his connections uh, to um, HSS, VHP America, the Hindutva movement in general. And um, I've gone to city councils, participated in protests and in particular, I got the opportunity to go to a campaign debate where he was at, where he was running for re-election. He was uh, debating his challenger. And I got a chance to go in the room and get him um, on camera for a few seconds, asking him what his opinion is about the RSS. And this is this is um, quite literally, he ran away from me. As soon as I approached him, yes. I asked him, Congressman, what, are your, what, are, what is your opinion of the RSS? His supporters who were ringing him around started shouting at me and he and then they put their hands on his shoulders and escorted them out of the room. True. I, I did see that uh, video.
Congressman, I just want to ask you, what are your views no, 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 on the RSS? Excuse me. What are your views on the Ivan? No, 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 uh, Rona Miller is kind of new on this scene. Uh, Rona Miller is now the lieutenant governor, or she will be, I think, taking office next month, but the uh, lieutenant governor-elect of Maryland. And uh, she's uh, one of the like new on the scene uh, people that is concerning as far as a potential Hindutva sympathizer. Now, I don't know, you know, when I say that I have to caveat, I don't know if she actually personally sympathizes with Hindutva, but she's certainly uh, unscrupulous enough, unprincipled enough that she's willing to rub shoulders with them and take their money, even after being repeatedly questioned and challenged about it. And uh, she's had a number of, uh, of uh, particular incidents, but she's taken a fair amount of money, well over $100,000 throughout her uh, political career of the past 10 years, uh, from in particular uh, leaders um, in the Overseas Friends of the BJP. Um, and she's attended uh, Overseas Friends of the BJP events in the past. Uh, she's also, if I recall correctly, attended HSS events. And just over this past year or so, past six months, in fact, I believe, she's been repeatedly challenged uh, by both Desi uh, and non-Desi um, uh, constituents within Maryland uh, about her association with these groups, about her taking money from these groups. And her response has basically been to just turn a blind eye and, and refuse to uh, offer anything except uh, just uh, flat denial. Basically, she's asked about this and she kind of comes back with, well, but I love Muslims. And, but, and, uh, and but but she has praised Modi quite openly. Yes, no, that's, that's correct. Um, it was at this Overseas Friends of the BJP event. And uh, I think, I think it was, it might've been 2014 itself. Um, at which uh, she actually, yes, yeah, she did praise Modi and she called Modi a rock star. But I also know that Democrats have uh, pushed the party uh, to to ensure that, you know, none of these affiliations or sympathies are actually, um, you know, that they, that they translate into anything policy wise in, in support of the Hindutva group. Yes, as, as they should. Um, and we haven't seen anything overt uh, policy wise uh, from the federal government, aside from which is still very deeply concerning, just the general deepening, uh, continued deepening of ties with Modi's fascist India between the US and now uh, uh, Biden Democrat controlled, uh, 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 or between the now Biden Democrat controlled US and uh, Modi's fascist India. That deepening of ties um, is very concerning because it's coming uh, faster and faster and it's unconditional. Like there don't appear to be any actual conditions imposed upon that, which I'm a strong supporter of, of um, deep uh, friendship with India. I think it's a perfect match for the US, uh, but it should come with conditions that, you know, we're not going to do it if, you know, for instance, you're slaughtering minorities in the streets. So, Peter, now uh, to wrap up, I have a couple of questions. One is that what would your um, advice be to people in the U.S., uh, not just Indian diaspora, but people in general about uh, being careful, um, supporting any businesses or giving to charities? How does this uh, this whole um you know, web works, like where, where is it that, you know, you may be giving money innocently or you're thinking you're helping a good cause, but it's actually going towards spreading violence and hate in India. So one is that, but yeah, so let's handle that first and then I'll have the last question for you. One um, you know, that's a good question. Um, I, I get people talking about this, honestly, personally, like I'm not a big fan of like the BDS style um, approach. Um, I think um, one reason is I think that that can tend to, in my opinion, veer to veer too quickly into actual prejudice, um, where it's just like, you know, we don't buy from Hindus. 
which is the exact same exact same thing that's happening in India, is they're you know making pledges that like you know we will not buy from Muslims, and um, that's so it's difficult to difficult to do that, especially because it's difficult to discern like you know if I go to a go to a store that's owned by by Hindu, for instance, I have no idea if they're a supporter of Hindutva or not. And I'm not going to sit, stand there and interrogate them. And indeed, it would be kind of bigoted for me to do so, to stand there and interrogate them and demand that they, like, you know, prove to me that, that they're not. So I'm not a big fan of that. Um, but certainly as far as uh, these major Peter, ones. Peter, just to interrupt, I just, you know, because many people may not know what, what BDS stands for. And I just want to clarify that it means boycott, boycott. and sanctions. And it was uh, basically started for Palestine. Yeah. And so so I'm I'm not going to describe, you know, my personal opinion is, is, is I, I don't support that approach in particular. Um, but I support more of a targeted approach um, of um, as far as like within on a domestic level, um, just being aware of like some of these major uh, groups like Save International, which is one of the big money raisers, um, huge, huge deep pockets, and which is supported by a lot of, I mean, like last year, Twitter uh, CEO uh, Jack Dorsey at the time gave $2.5 million to Save International. Uh, just one example they get a lot of corporate support in america and i think really um especially for anybody that uh works for some place where their company or their corporation might be giving money to support charities like just making sure like those ones are really easy ones to prove and to knock off the list and like if you want to do bds at least like do it like for a couple of major ones like that now i do support i do support sanctions in, in one particular way and i've had people like i I don't support uh, sanctions, for instance, like like against Iraq, for instance, when the U.S. was sanctioning Iraq in the 90s. What I believe and what a lot of people have argued is that that didn't impact Saddam Hussein. That impacted the common person on the ground. And they're the ones that suffered as a result of it. You know, the million children estimated to have died because of U.S. sanctions on Iraq. What I do support and which the U.S. could do is targeted sanctions against individuals. Um, and that's one thing where we have this uh, in America, we have this U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, which is an independent mm -hmm. autonomous entity of the U.S. State Department, which for the past several years, including this year, has recommended to the State Department, recommended that India should be listed as a country of particular concern, which the U.S. State Department just refused to do uh, this uh, just uh, recently. But if, if the U.S. State Department did do that, that would allow the government of, you know, the U.S. government to legally impose targeted sanctions on individuals like, say, Amit Shah or Modi or uh, Aditya Nath and basically uh, ban them from entry to the U.S., freeze all of their international assets and do things like that and apply pressure to the actual specific individuals. The problem really right now is that these people are in power. So when it did happen, for example, there was a sanction against Modi uh, entering the U.S. It was at a time that he was not uh, the prime minister, you know, even though though he 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 was the uh, the head of Gujarat, the state. So I think that does make it a bit trickier because it's with, really with all of these with all these lower level people. However, mm -hmm. like like I think Modi as the PM is kind of the exception. Like Adityanath, for instance, just like Modi was, he could be denied entry to the US uh, if I if I'm not mistaken all of these all these party leaders basically anybody except except the you know PM like any chief minister all of these people it's possible to ban them from the US and um, also it, also I mean people who don't hold office like for example Ritambra you know uh, I don't yeah, understand exactly. why she was uh, allowed entry because you know she has a, a very um, infamous track record of inciting violence um, so you know she should not have been allowed yeah so I do agree and and um, you know I think sanctions only work in very specific cases they did work in South Africa to end apartheid certainly but they don't generally work because it's the poor who suffer um, and also I think that the anti-Hindutva movement is not yet strong enough to even um, you know make that possible so it's not a possibility at least right now uh, last question for you uh, Peter you see diversity and inclusion have become um, very 
important. You know, these are words that even corporates use. They have special uh, officers who take care of, of, you know, diversity and inclusion in the organizations. However, it can it, it without understanding what it actually means, uh, we can do a lot of damage. So, for example, if we oppose um, Krishnamurti or say um, um, Tulsi Gabbard, uh, we can be accused of of racism, which is obviously not the case because the people who are fighting them, <laughs> most of them are also Indian. People who are opposing RSS in general are are many of them are Indians. Most of them are Indians. Okay. Because yeah, so uh, so you know it becomes a very tricky subject, and as you said earlier, many people are too ignorant. Uh, they have they don't understand what is the difference between uh, Indian and Indian. You know, I mean, somebody may look like an Indian and still be doing things that are harming most of the Indians. The, Sorry. There is a presumption broadly within a lot of of, of of Americans that all Indians are Hindu, and, and I encounter this all the time. And 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 the the, the Indians that uh, the Indian friends that I, I collaborate with who are trying to do outreach to like non non Indian uh, politicians especially they encounter this all the time. And also, you know, as we discussed earlier, there's not enough information available, uh, or or people have not been exposed to um, the the fascist. Uh, trends in 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 Indian politics. So you know that's very important. So how does one deal with that? Have you been able to uh, to counter that in a successful way? You know this allegation or accusation that oh you are racist, you know, or you are anti Indian or anti Asian and so on. Yeah, that's a good question, and it's something that I I think about a lot. When I go to a lot of these city councils. Um, I speak there, and these days, especially to avoid confusion and muddying the waters for this Western audience that's totally unfamiliar with these issues, I typically, I give speeches in which I don't even use the word Hindu. So, like, I used to give speeches where I would talk about how RSS is a Hindu nationalist paramilitary, uh, which it is. But I have typically, in these short, like, three-minute speeches, I never say that anymore. I say the RSS is a fascist paramilitary, which it is. And then oftentimes in most of the city councils where I go, I'll show up. And then within like the following meeting or the meeting after that, the HSS will show up to try and like tamp things down. And, 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 you know, like you know, after I went and I, I, I was being a troublemaker and like, you know, trying bad mouthing their organization and they'll show up. And I'll have given a speech, you know, like this, where I say RSS is a fascist organization, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, HSS is its international wing. And not once do I mention, even mention the word Hindu. And they'll show up, HSS will, uh, as backlash to me, and say, you know, Peter was there. You know, he he was he was attacking our, our uh, religion. You know, it's Hindu phobic remarks. Like, we feel like, you know, as Hindus, we feel like so insulted. And just constantly like reverting to like that, that fallback that, that, oh my God, you know, I've taught, I'm, I'm, all I'm ever doing is I'm naming an organization. I'm talking about an organization, a specific organization, but their constant fallback is Hindu phobia, Hindu phobia. He's, he's attacking the entire religion. Um, and so within context of like that diversity and, and, and inclusion and, and um, that sort of um approach and that pluralistic approach that is um a mm -hmm. rhetoric a narrative that they employ which is difficult to counter um but which certainly uh can and should be countered at least to some extent uh, can be i think by just constantly reiterating reiterating one that hss does not represent the religion like, like I said, like maybe 30,000 members across the country out of, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of Hindus? And two, that RSS and, you know, HSS by, by virtue of being the, uh, the affiliate of RSS, RSS is implicitly uh, against diversion and inclusivity and pluralism and all of these values of a secular society. 
that's actually then, a very oh. that's actually a very good point because you know an organization that believes in homogeneity you know pushes for homogeneity <laughs> talking about diversity and inclusion is a joke in itself yeah and then in, in my particular specific case um with the work that i do the work that i do i can't do it i won't do it i will stop doing it um I can't do it. I won't do it uh, without the support of the Indian American uh, diaspora and also many uh, uh, citizens of India that I know living in the country who support what I do. And I will stop doing it if I don't have their support. And my preference all the time, every time, I can't do this every time, unfortunately, because I I do this full time. And most of the Indian Americans here that are willing to collaborate with me have jobs that don't involve full-time work on the issues of NDEPA, even if they support it. But as much as possible, I want to do this work on the ground in physical collaboration with members of the Indian diaspora, because it's it's their cause, it's their cause that is deep in my heart, and that I want to make my cause on their behalf as long as they welcome me to do so. And so as far as the diversity and inclusion thing, especially being being a white man in America, um, that's one of the things that I think is very important is to have constant, constant collaboration with diverse uh, segments of the Indian American community. Well, as part of the Indian diaspora, I certainly welcome uh, what you're doing. I welcome that support. At the same time, I appreciate that you recognize the importance of saying that look and and believing not just saying that uh, that look you know it is the cause of the indian people and the indian diaspora and i am there to support it um, as long as they think that you know my presence will help in it um and we saw that even with the struggle against british colonialism gandhi actually had a lot of support from britain from ireland uh, you know and and there were people who who devoted their entire lives uh, to the struggle against uh, colonialism in in in, in India, uh, and they were white. Um, so you know, I mean, it, it's it's amazing that people do come together when they see and recognize a cause, um, when they see the importance of that cause, and that you know, when their conscience uh, says to them that look, you know, you must act. So I do appreciate that, well, well, Peter. If, if I may, uh, if I, I my butcher, but what is it, Vasudeva Katu? Vasudeva, yeah. Vasu, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Yes, yes. Yes. The whole world is one family, which is like, you know, it's seized upon by the RSS is like, that's their go to quote that, well, this is what we believe, which, you know, my response is, well, you, you may believe that, but what do you believe about how you treat the members of your family? Um, but yeah, the whole world is one family. I believe that. And it's it's crucial like, for us to come together because we're all human. We all bleed red. And, you know, what what hurts, you know, that's what what it, what impacts what hurts people in india impacts hurts people in america and elsewhere so peter um we will conclude now uh, and if you have any last words especially uh, with regards to why you are continuing to do this work despite the challenges you know i i'll i'd be happy to hear that and then we will conclude well, the why is because i'm passionate about it uh, all of my closest and dearest friends at this point are our indians um, I am so deeply involved uh, and in, uh, entrenched in this work. I've been doing this for about 16 and a half years. And at this point, I can't imagine doing anything uh, differently. And I don't want to do anything differently because I uh, love what I do. And I especially, uh, especially um, deeply grateful for the love that I receive back from, constantly back from, far more than, even than the hate that I receive, but the love that I receive back from um, Indians all around the world um, who... Um, uh, humble me with uh, with what they have to say to me um, as far as in support of the work that I'm doing. Peter Friedrich, it was a pleasure to talk to you and we wish you all the best in the work that you're doing. Um, we also wish you added strength in this environment where um, violence has become so commonplace. And I know that even though you're in the United States, physical threats are a reality. Uh, so we do wish you well. And we hope that this work will continue and more and more people will join so that India can get its 
democracy back. As you said earlier, uh, it really is in the grips of a fascist um, regime. It ha India has been taken over by a fascist regime, but people like you are fighting bravely. So definitely things will change. Thank you, Shireen. It was a pleasure talking. We enjoyed the conversation very much. You were listening to Baobab, Redwood, and Neen by Peace Vigil. Our guest today was Peter Friedrich. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment, and we'll see you next time.